many times we talk about that word, <laughs> holiness. We talk about it in ways that are misleading. We talk about it in purely negative terms, oftentimes. Holiness is what you don't do, right? Don't do this. Don't do that. Stop it. Never again. If you want to be holy, you've got to pay attention to the negatives. And it's kind of off-putting, isn't it? Someone who's always saying no. Sometimes when we talk about holiness, we mis misportray it by portraying it as an unreachable goal. Maybe I met that one person that one time who seemed really spiritual. Bonus level Christianity. Superstar. But, nobody, but it's only the one person, and I'm not even altogether sure about him. And, and it's, it's, it's just this thing that the Bible talks about, but only God is really holy and the rest of us don't stand a chance. So it's either undesirable, don't do this, or it's an unreachable goal, nobody gets there anyway. The trouble with that is, we run into texts like 1 Thessalonians 4.3, <laughs> where Paul unequivocally says, clearly says, here's God's will for your life, holiness. And we stop to think, we say, well, I thought that was the, like, the legalism and the don't do this and the don't do that and the rules, and I just, that, if that's God's will, then that's not very exciting and I'd rather do something else because who can do it anyway? It's an unreachable goal. It's negative. But if we read through the Scriptures, we discover that like, when Paul's talking about holiness, he's also talking about love. Yes, that means that there's some self-control involved. <laughs> yes, it involves things that we do and don't do. But it's not reducible to a list of kind of legal restrictions. For Paul, it's ultimately about love. And it's not something that you can't ever reach. For Paul, it's something that life in the present just gets more and more and more of. Did you catch that a couple of times? I want you to abound more and more and more. So for Paul, holiness is radically different from the kind of assumptions that we bring. We'll explore more why that is in a few minutes, but we just need to kind of take a minute and maybe clear the palette of our minds. In the Bible, in Paul, holiness is radically different from the assumptions we usually bring. For Paul, holiness is not a bonus level. It's our starting point. It's not that unreachable goal that only a few really super spiritual people get to. It's step one for everybody on the path of following Jesus. Holiness is not a bonus round or a bonus level. It's a starting point. So why do we start with holy? It's pretty straightforward. We've already looked at it a couple of times. Let's hear it one more time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He affirms the apostle that they're already living in ways that please God because they love one another. They're resisting the persecution. We've talked about it in the last few weeks. The Thessalonians are facing some suffering and some persecution because they've turned from worshiping idols to worshiping gods. Their neighbors are kind of looking at them like, why aren't y'all showing up anymore for the... <laughs> Idol worship, they didn't call it idol worship, obviously. They called it the worship of their gods. But that's the kind of thing that's going on there. It's part of the social fabric of the ancient world. And when people become Christians in the ancient world, they begin to tear that social fabric apart. And everybody else didn't like that very much. And so Paul says, you're living to please God. You're being faithful. You're maintaining the faith. You're loving one another. 
I want you to do that more and more and more. Remember, it's not this kind of switch you flip where you're either doing it or you're not doing it. For Paul, it's this, it's this thing that you can never have enough. So here's God's will. Here's what He wants. Chapter 4, verse 3. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. And sanctification is just a word that describes this process of becoming holy. I meet people all the time. It's like, oh, I just want to know God's will for me. You know, I meet college students who get paralyzed because they can't figure out God's will. And so they don't pick what they want to do. And they just kind of stay and spend mom and dad's money for years and years and years. right? Because they don't know God's will for their life yet. I mean, how many times does the Scripture actually just say, here's God's will, here's His best, here's what He wants for you? What is it? And it's not different for everybody, it's the same for everyone, isn't it? There's one thing God wants, and honestly, if you get this right, you can do pretty much whatever. (laughs) Because if you get this right, you'll be doing what God wants. Holiness. For Paul, sanctification, holiness isn't portrayed as something that you'll never get to or something that only some people get to. This is what God wants for his people, without exception. Now, why does Paul think that way? The reason Paul thinks this way is because Paul spent his entire life being immersed in the Old Testament. And if you read the Old Testament, you discover that all the way through, There's this reverberating theme that God has called himself a people and he wants his people to embody his holy character. That means he wants his people to be holy. So when God constitutes a people for himself, he does it after he delivers them from from, from Egypt through the Exodus. The story is told in the opening chapters of the book of Exodus, second book in the Bible. And then they get to the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses goes up on the mountain to speak to God. And God says, here's what I want you to tell the people. I'll just start reading from the beginning of chapter 19. It's worth going over multiple times. We mentioned it with some frequency, and there's a reason for that. Those of you who are teachers, remember the things that get repeated, you want your students to know it'll be on the test, right? So if the preacher gets repeating things, it'll be on the test. We read Exodus 19 with some frequency for that very reason. On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, right? So they've been delivered by God with all these spectacular displays of glory and his power. They journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai. The words in their pronunciation, that won't be on the test. (laughs) Just Exodus. Then Moses went up to God. They camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain saying, here's what I want you to say to the house of Jacob. Israel, my people. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all my peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but, and this should be familiar. I hope it's becoming familiar. We'll get back to it again in a few more weeks, probably. You shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. So God says, look, like yesterday you were slaves. Now I've brought you to my, I've rescued you by grace. Like, did they deserve his rescue? Did they sort of, did Moses go along to him and say, hey, guess what? God's going to rescue you, but for 500 years I need you to keep these rules, earn his favor, and then he'll save you from slavery. Right? That's not the approach, is it? So don't let people tell you the Old Testament's kind of saved by works and New Testament's saved by grace. Grace runs cover to cover throughout the Bible. God rescues people who don't deserve it. He brings them out, brings them to says, I'm bringing you to myself, I'm making you my special treasure. The word for special treasure there is a, it's the word in Hebrew that a bride, for the, for the jewelry a bride wears on her wedding day. Think of it. So God's saying, like, this is like our, our wedding day. I'm bringing you, I'm going to give you my covenant. I'm committing myself to you. I want you to commit yourself to me. I love you. I care for you. I want you to be my people. I, I want to be your God. And here's what that means. Number one, notice... You don't get, you can be my people for a long time, and then we'll talk about holiness. Day one, let's sign the Constitution. 
Here's the covenant. I want you to be a holy people. Like, the nation of Israel starts with holy. It's not a, hey, we'll be together for a while and I'll be your God and you'll be my people and you'll mess it up really badly and later on we'll talk about holiness. That's not how this works, is it? Yesterday, they were slaves in Egypt. Today, God has called them to be a people of holy, marked by holiness. He also wants them to be a kingdom of priests. Did you catch that? Everybody remember what priests do? Priests stand in between God and everybody else. Say, hey, let's get this thing together. They cultivate the relationship. They mediate a relationship between God and the nation. God says, I want you to be that for the nations for me. You stand between me and all the other nations that belong to me. You be my holy people. You're set apart for this calling. I'm going to show you what it looks like to embody my character, but this is what I want you to show the nations my holiness. Not later, now. In Exodus 19, holiness isn't a bonus level. It's a starting point. It's not an unreachable goal. It's a starting point. It's not just a list of rules. It's a vocation for the people of God. All of them. None excluded. God's a very inclusive God. Everyone is included in his plan for holiness. So what does it look like? Well, let's talk about that. Exodus 19 is one of the best places to go. We've talked about this one before too. It's worth reviewing. It'll be on the test. Exodus 19 is often called the Holiness Code, which is one of the most daunting names for anything in the whole Bible, probably. If you wanted uh, one of those sort of negative-sounding things, Holiness Code probably fits the bill, doesn't it? But that's what, that's what we get. So here's how it goes. We won't read the whole chapter, just a bit. Remember, Paul is immersed in these texts. He's a Hebrew, an Israelite. He spent his life being immersed in in the history of the people of Israel, in the story. It's his history. It's his people. It's his story. And now Jesus has come to make it full and make it whole. So God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to be my holy people. Here's what it looks like. I, the Lord your God, am holy. Therefore, you shall be holy. Notice this is something God wants his people to have that he shares in common with them. This is what I'm like. This is what I want you to be like. Honor your mother and father. Really, that's where you start, God. <laughs> you want me to respect people, and that's what holiness looks like. I thought you were going to ask for something crazy. Honor your father and mother. I'm the Lord your God. Don't worship idols. So you don't want me to give the worship that only you deserve to other things, little statues that I've made out of my hands. That doesn't sound ridiculous either, does it? Verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, leave some on the edges. Don't strip the vineyard bare. Don't gather all the fallen grapes. Leave some for the poor and the alien. Oh, wait a second, God. I thought we were talking about holiness. <laughs> God says we are. Holiness means you find the poor and carve out a special place in your heart for them. Make sure they have some grapes to eat. But God, why? Because when you were in Egypt and you were slaves and you were poor, I carved out a special place in my heart for you and carried you on eagle's wings to myself and blessed you with my covenant and promised you the land flowing of milk and honey. And when you get it, you remember what it feels like to be poor. I'm the Lord your God. You shall be holy because I'm holy. Verse 11, you shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. Ah, oh, here we go. Now we're getting into the don't do this and don't do that stuff, right? Right? 
Maybe. Or maybe God is trying to tell the people of Israel something about himself. You see, in the ancient world, there were millions of gods to choose from. And they varied a bit depending on which nation you went to. The Egyptians, things looked a little bit different than in other parts of the ancient Near East. The one thing that was consistent about all those millions of gods is that none of them were consistent. They were liars. They were cheaters. They would take advantage of you. They would deceive you. They would manipulate you. They would exploit you. And they would basically have their way with you. And you didn't know if they were going to wake up grumpy and wanting to chunk you off the end of the world or happy and bless you with rain for your crops. The one thing that's consistent is that they are not consistent. They cannot be trusted. They are not dependable. They are fickle. Maybe, just maybe, the Creator is trying to teach His people something about His character. I'm the Lord your God. You shall be like Me. Don't lie to people. I'm the Lord your God. You should embody My character. Don't steal from your neighbor. I'm the Lord your God. you got to be like me. Don't deal falsely with people. And over, it's, it's as practical as it gets, over and over and over and over again, you be like me. Don't lie. You be like me. Have integrity. You be like me. Don't exploit people. Over and over. Finally, finally they would begin to realize God has integrity. He doesn't steal. He doesn't deceive. He always does what's right. He always does what's true. He always keeps His promises. He's not like the gods in Egypt. Not even remotely. He can be trusted to keep His covenant. Don't get distracted by the do-nots. Focus on what they're there for. They are there to tell us about a char the character of a God who is unlike any other who claims to be a God. He is consistent. He keeps His promises. He's perfectly faithful. And if He wants His people to embody His character, like God is not the kind of God who says, hey, guess what? You can have integrity later. <laughs> like, what kind of God would that be anyway? I mean, think about it. Imagine if you went to work and your, your boss is like, hey, yeah, yeah, we're, we're good with integrity later. Like, that's not the kind of person you want to work for. I hope it's not the kind of person you want to work for. It's not the kind of God you want, is it? You want a God who says, hey, guess what? We're going to build integrity in on the ground floor. <laughs> like, step one, start with it. Integrity is not a bonus level that we hope we get to one day. You know, truthfulness is not a bonus level that we hope we get to one day. That's where we start. Step one. Start with holiness. That's what it means to be the people of God. Again and again. This is the story that the Apostle Paul grew up in. Now how well did it go? It didn't go well, did it? You get to Ezekiel chapter 36. I know we skipped a big chunk, but you know we've only got so much time. And God is just put out with the nation of Israel. Because they've taken his covenant and they went outside after a rain and found the biggest mud puddle they could find and just dropped the covenant in it and stomped on it. Like That's what they did. Because <laughs> he said, I want you to have integrity, but then they didn't live in it with integrity. He said, I want you to be truthful. They weren't truthful. He said, you know, I'd... I want you to honor people, and you committed murder, and God just lays out this long list. It's like an indictment against them. It says, you've profaned my name. You've dragged my name through the mud. You've sullied my covenant. So here's what I'm going to do, God says. Verse 22, Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. Right? You have... You have Ruin my reputation, I'm going to set it right. I'm going to vindicate my reputation. That's what that means. 
Verse 23, I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And the nation shall know, get this, that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. There's that word again. Day one, I want you to be a holy nation. What's that look like? Well, here's a code. <laughs> It's like integrity. It looks like dealing honorably with people. It looks like not exploiting people. A thousand years go by. Oh, wow, we really messed that up. <laughs> God says, that's all right. I'm going to fix it. The nations will know that I'm God. That I have the power to transform when I show my holiness. Not over here because you messed it up I mean after all you ruined your opportunity so I'll start over that's not what he says is it the nations will know that I'm holy says God when I show my holiness in your bodies through you and you may think the Israelites are probably saying God have you been listening to yourself I mean you just rattled off the rap sheet come on the indictment is clear. We've committed murder, we've lied, we've stolen, we've coveted, we've, all of the stuff. We've done it, and we're, we're bad. We know. You've said so. Are you not paying attention to the words that are coming out of your mouth? How are you going to show your holiness in us? We don't have it. And God says, I'm glad you asked. Here's what I'm going to do. And here's what, remember what's writing on this. Like The nations will not know that God is God if it doesn't happen. Catch that? Verse 23. The nations will, this, that, that's what's writing. If God's people don't embody his character, nobody will know he's God. Say that's a big wager on God's part. So what's he going to do? He says, I'm going to take you from the nations. I'm going to gather you, right? Again, there's the grace. You don't deserve this, but I'm going to bring, the, bring you to myself. Grace all the way through the story. I'm going to gather you from the countries. I'm going to bring you into your land. I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean from all your uncleannesses. All the things you've done, the mud you've splashed in, the dirt you've given yourself to, I will cleanse you. And brothers and sisters, just listen. Like There is no shame. There is no dirt. There is no... Like, whatever it is, people come, and they come with this, these, these experiences of... of Sometimes it's your fault, sometimes it's not your fault, but no matter what happened, you still feel the shame in the dirt. The good news of the gospel is that the Lord Jesus Christ comes with clean water. And there's nothing he can't handle. There is no uncleanness that he cannot restore. That's the good news of the gospel, friend. I meet folks and they're like, I got too much baggage. I got too much shame. Jesus won't have me. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Because I will sprinkle you with clean water from all of your uncleanness, right? Not most of it, not 75%, not even 99.99999%. All of it. If you got uncleanness, Jesus says, I will take it and I will cleanse it. From all your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you. I'm going to take that old heart, right? That's the problem, isn't it? That's what the Israelites didn't know about. Yeah, we'll be your people. Thanks for rescuing us from slavery. Sure, we want to be holy. Honor our parents. Sounds great. Don't worship idols. We're on board. What they didn't realize is that their hearts were made of stone. It's very hard not to worship idols when your heart is made of stone. It's impossible. <laughs> It's very hard to be a person of integrity when you have a rock for a heart. And so what does God say? I'm going to remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. 
I'm going to put my spirit in you so that you can follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you'll live in the land I gave to your ancestors. Like, this is one of the most grace and mercy saturated passages of Scripture I can ever find. Like, God has just laid out all of the horrific things they've done, the ways they've sinned. And he says, friends, my children, I love you, my bride, I'm taking you to myself, I'm going to gather you, I'm going to, you bring all of the guilt and all of the shame and all of the hurt and all of, the, all, of the, all of it, and I will cleanse it. And then that thing in you, so that, 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 that reality, that principle in your life, the stony heart, so that when you're facing temptation, I'd really like to honor God in this moment, and here I find myself not. God says, I'm, going to, I'm taking it. And I'm going to replace it with a heart that can love me. Why? So you can be holy. So you can embody my character. That's what I want for you. I want you to embody my character. And when you do, the nations are going to know that I've got a power those idols only wish they had. Because an idol can't fix our stony hearts. A false god can't put a living spirit into a human being. But when the living God does it, then the folks you work with, they'll know whose God is God. When the living God puts his spirit in his people, our neighbors will know whose God is the real God. When the living God puts his spirit in his people, the nations will know that God is God. Because nobody else can redeem and transform and set free and heal from shame and heal from guilt. God alone, the living God, can do that. Start with holy. It's not a bonus level. It's not a pipe dream. God says, this is where we start. We're going to deal with the dirt so that I can make you whole and the world will be filled with the beauty of my glory. Why did Paul tell the Thessalonians to start with holiness? Because the whole Bible says start with holiness. All of it. That's the story. It's not an unreachable goal. It's not a bonus level. It's the story. It's not for a special chosen few. It's God's will for all his people. So what does it look like in the real world? Paul goes on. This is God's will, your sanctification, your holiness. That you abstain from fornication, that each of you know how to control your body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we've already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For Paul, holiness has to do with using our bodies in ways that honor other people. Now, he also understands that in the ancient world, there were a lot of people who were out to exploit other people. Uh, believe it or not, um, men in the ancient world seemed constantly uh, engaged in games of exploitation where if they could exploit someone, it helped their honor. <laughs> we never experienced anything like that, do we? <laughs> and Paul is saying, look, guys, life is not a constant competition to see how many times you can get one over on somebody A lot of times that involves sexuality. A lot of times it involves business dealings in the ancient world. People get taken advantage of and they get hurt. Paul says, number one, God is the avenger. He will care for you. If somebody like that has done something to you, God will care for you. He loves you. Whatever they do won't stop that. He loves you. 
You are precious in his sight. And the folks who sort of live by those rules, <laughs> it's time to stop. Like again, for Paul, yes, there are do this, don't do this. But the goal, the point is not the list. The point is the community that arises by people who use their lives, their bodies, to honor one another. When I speak, do I use my words in ways that honor people? Or am I always looking to get a word in? <laughs> get my little crew together and, you know, they're expecting a report. So I'll give them a report. And it may not be very favorable for that guy, but hey, that's, <laughs> that's it's not gossip, it's just the news, right? So it's like, do we really want the people of God to regard each other that way? Are we really going to deal with that kind of falsity? That lack of integrity? No, the apostle says. God has not called us to impurity. He's called us to holiness. And that means other-oriented love. That's what it looks like. Concerning the love of the brothers. Verse 9. You don't have to you don't need people to write to you. You're doing it. You've been taught by God to love one another. Verse 10, do it more. Right? Holiness and love are not one of these things where like, there's a quota to be filled. <laughs> it's like, Well, we're good this month. That's enough holiness for us. No, no. Like more and more and more. Because this is about God's character overflowing in the lives of his people. And don't we want God's character to overflow in the lives of his people? I mean, I think that's a good place to be. We want God's character abounding in the lives of his people. So how does he do it? What is it? How does it how does how does the transformation actually happen? Verse 8. Let's start with verse 7. God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Right? Start with holy. This is who you're called. We've already talked about how God called Israel, the whole story, his people are there. Now the nations, the Thessalonians and the Hopolians have been incorporated into the people of God through Jesus. The calling that was there belongs to all of us. God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this, rejects not human authority. That's a big deal, right? Like if you think that this preacher's off his rocker with all this talk of holiness, well, Paul's got words for you. Right? Whoever rejects this rejects not human authority, but God who gives His Holy Spirit. How does He do it? In Ezekiel, He gives His Spirit. How does He do it? In 1 Thessalonians, He gives His Spirit. And how do we get the Spirit? Jesus, with His cross, cleanses us. Jesus, with His shed blood and broken body, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, because, because we have transgressed and deserve condemnation, because we are sinners. Right? Nobody's pretending that we don't have a checkered past. Everybody's got a checkered past. All of us. And Jesus comes and says, I see your checkered past. I see your deceit. I see your lack of integrity. I see it, and I love you. I see your slavery, I see your darkness, I see your shame, I see, all, I see all of it, and I love you, and I'll die for you. And all the weight, and all of the pain, and all of the horror, I take it on myself. And you're clean. And now that you're clean, I have a gift for you. And because this gift can't dwell in unclean places. Now that you're clean, here's my spirit. Jesus didn't die just to get us clean. He died to get us clean so that he could put his spirit in our bodies. He gives his spirit to change his people from impurity to holiness. Not later, now. Nowhere in this text does Paul say, you know, this will happen when Jesus comes back. <laughs> There's only three of you who will make it to the bonus level. Remember when I was a kid, we played Super Mario Brothers. It's vintage now. Um, Ty remembers and will. Some of you might be too old, but maybe your kids had them. Anyway, there were codes. 
you needed the codes to get to the bonus levels. I never, I was not good at these kinds of things. Not a video game. I liked the game, but I was not really particularly good at it. But you needed, the, is that right? Yeah, there were codes or something. Combinations of buttons, and if you got them, there were bonus levels, and you could get the coins and points and things like that. I fell back. I was never good at that kind of stuff. Fingers weren't fast enough. It just wasn't right. Only a select few ever made it to the bonus level. And in middle school, they were like, those were the cool kids. They had the dexterity. They could pull it off. Holiness isn't like that, friends. Paul never says it's only for the cool kids, or it's only for the spiritual people, or it's only for the, you know, the pastors, or only for the whatever, you know. Pick the group. It's that, that's not the way he talks about it. This is God's will for you. That you should share his character. This is God's will for you. That his spirit should empower integrity in your life. This is God's will for you. That the nations will know that God is God because he's producing his life in your body. Take a minute, friends, and think about what the world would be like if the church actually believed that. And said, you know what, God? We're on board with it. We, we surrender. We're going to stop resisting that. Well, I mean, think about what the world would be like if the church believed the Bible on this. I mean, would you like to work with people who are embodying the character of God? Co you know, co-workers who embody the character of God seems like a plus to me. Would you like... Living with your spouse if they embody the character of God? Seems like a plus to me. <laughs> Would you like your church <laughs> if the people in your Sunday school embodied the character of God? And if everything was driven, and this is really our goal, by the way, every decision we make at this place is driven by this vision. To see the world filled, to see our neighborhoods filled, and our region filled, and the world filled with people who embody the beauty and the glory and the love that is the character of God. That's our vision. That's what drives us. That's who we are. That's what it means to be Wesleyan Methodists. It's the only thing we have to do. Take a minute to, it's, I know it's dangerous, but you can even close your eyes if you want to. Take a minute to try to imagine what would the world be like? What will the world be like when the people of God consistently start with God's will, his best, that we should embody his character. Now, if that's a world you want to live in, raise your hand. You know where to start. It starts with each one of us, doesn't it? it? starts with whatever the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, you know, there's this thing that you haven't offered to me yet. Hey, maybe it's your marriage. You haven't offered it to me yet. Maybe it's your business. The Holy Spirit's saying you haven't offered me that yet. Maybe it's your life. <laughs> maybe you've never offered Jesus your life. That's step one, isn't it? Don't say no. We talk a lot about our discipleship path. This is the point of that. We worship Jesus. We connect with each other. We do mission so the nations will know that God is God. So that we can embody his Christ-like character. Start with holy.